I am honored to present my friend, Ziggy Schmidt, for enshrinement into the National Soccer Hall of Fame. Getting older, senility is setting in. I don't want to miss anybody. Um, you know, I, obviously, I want to keep it together because uh, that's something that's sometimes difficult for me to do in moments like this. But uh, first of all, you know, I'd like to congratulate, uh, you know, Glenn Mooch Meyernick for getting inducted into his family. He left us way too early. We all know that. Uh, Casey Keller, you know, who's uh, been an icon amongst goalkeepers and players and and great captain when I had him here at, at Seattle. Uh, I want to thank them. I want to thank my good friend, Dean Wurzberger. Uh, you know, we've been through a lot together. Um, you know, a lot of coaching schools together and, uh, and uh, trips. Uh, you know, my nickname for him was MacGyver because uh, he had everything. If I lost a button on my shirt, he had a sewing kit. Uh, he'd make tea in the morning and we'd have a glass of Chardonnay at night. Uh, so, and he brought the glasses and he brought the tea and he brought the Chardonnay. Uh, want to obviously thank U.S. Soccer. You know, uh, Dan Flynn, who, who I, I know for a long time, we've kicked each other, Sunil Galati, uh, for all that he's done for the game. You know, Hank Steinbreaker, who we actually coached against each other way back when at Boston University. Hank, I'm sorry, this might be long, so I don't know if you want to sit down. <laughs> so, I want to thank the Sounders, you know, Adrian Hanauer, Joe Roth, you know, for, and what you guys did here tonight, you know, by making this happen in conjunction with U.S. soccer. You know, I think this is a fantastic venue, and, uh, and it's a wonderful evening. Um, there's a few people I need to thank, and I don't want to miss anybody, so that's why I have to write some notes. But uh, first off, I want to thank my wife, Valerie. Uh, for being there. As she said to me when we got married, uh, I know what you are. Uh, I wasn't quite sure what that meant. Uh, <laughs> but I think she meant soccer coach. Uh, so when I went to Columbus, you know, she was okay with that and the travel. I want to thank my father, Fritz, uh, who's still with us at 90. I think that deserves a round of applause for being there. And he might be fitter than a lot of 60-year-olds still in this room. Uh, my mother, Doris, uh, who passed away way too early and left us, but... But was so important in my life. To my three sons, Eric, Kurt, and Kyle, and their families, wife and grandchildren, um, you know, raising three boys was difficult, and when I met Valerie, all of a sudden a 13-year-old daughter entered into my life by the name of Lacey. So when you have three boys and all of a sudden a girl comes into your life, you know, toilet habits become really quickly assessed and deciphered. <laughs> Who left that toilet seat up? Uh, why doesn't anybody put it down? Mommy, what's wrong with them? Uh, I'd like to thank my brother. Uh, who's always been there for me. You know, we're 10 years apart, uh, but we've always been very close. Uh, you know, luckily he didn't get too mad at me when I coached him. Uh, and luckily for me, when I coached him and played him, he ended up either scoring a goal or getting an assist in his first four games. So it made it a little bit easier to put him on the field, but him and his family. Uh, forgot to mention my grandchildren. We've got three now. We've got two more on the way, so we're going to have five soon. Uh, so that's important. Uh, I also want to thank a lot of my fellow teammates who are here, guys I've played with, guys I started playing with at 11 years of old, of age, Peter Fredrickson, uh, Mac Lasilla, 
you know, Maureen Cano, who's not here with us, Jose Lopez, who was very instrumental for me when I, I first came to UCLA, and uh, Peter Fredrickson and me go way back, as do Matt, and uh, there's a lot of shared memories that we have together. Uh, as a coach, you always have mentors and you always have people that have helped you and that you look up to. Uh, you know, my first coach, George Scotty Kay, was very influential uh, as to what later became of me as soccer. I was always soccer passionate, but he certainly helped. Uh, Max Wozniak uh, was my coach in those days, you know, as, as, as was said so eloquently by Travis, you know, it was ethnic leagues everywhere, you know, so in LA it was the same. The Germans had a team, the Hungarians had a team, the Argentines had a team, and, you know, I ended up playing for Max Wozniak on a, on a Scandinavian team of all things, but he shared with me at a very young age his notes, you know, of his German uh, soccer school and when he went for his Bundesliga license, and I was a 20-year-old that devoured those notes uh, and, and held on to them. Dennis Storr, my first coach at UCLA, I have to thank with that uh, Joe Bonchonsky, whose son Andy is here tonight as well, uh, because, you know, a time where my family, you know, were immigrants, they really didn't know what college was all about, and uh, this gentleman, Joe Bonchonsky, took an interest in me and dragged me out to UCLA and introduced a coach to me and made their coach go watch me play in a game. And eventually, you know, I, I received a soccer scholarship and was technically the first American. But as Dennis told me later, uh, years, years later when I visited him, he said, you know, Ziggy, we had no money. So myself and Hugh McCracken are the guys who paid for your scholarship. So, so you learn a lot of things afterwards. Terry Fisher, who's here tonight, who was one of my coaches at UCLA. Steve Gay, who I saw the other day, another coach at UCLA. Lothar Osiander, who, uh, you know, going through coaching schools, always had that passion and that, and that joy about him that was great. It's a great day to be alive. We're on the soccer field. What else can be, you know, better than this? Uh, Bob Gansler, who gave me my opportunities, first off to work with Jimmy Lennox, you know, on, on the B national team, and that was a, a great opportunity, but also gave me my opportunities in U.S. soccer with the national team. Dieter Schulte, a good friend of mine, a teammate of mine at UCLA. In those days, things were much different. I was 18 years old, and he was a 31-year-old junior. Uh, <laughs> so it's a little bit tough when guys were showing up with their wives and kids at games, and uh, you were just there, you know, hoping to get rid of your pimples as you came to the game. Uh, but Dieter Schulte went on to become the assistant coach at Bayern Munich, uh, was, a, was a coach as well with Eintracht Frankfurt, and opened the door for me over there so I could continue to learn, I could continue to develop. Another guy who was very influential, and his son Harry is here tonight, was Harry Tweedy Sr. And I remember when I was deciding whether to leave UCLA and go and go and become a coach of the Galaxy, and my reason for talking to Harry was when I was a very young coach and had a youth team, uh, and I thought it was a pretty good under-19 team, and I was maybe 23 years old at the time, and I thought I was pretty hot crap, maybe like a coach a little bit south of here, uh, who we refuse to mention at this time. But uh, <laughs> it's only a little joke, Caleb, take it that way. Uh, is, you know, and, and all of a sudden, my team played this team from San Diego, and it was coached by Harry Tweedy Sr. And I thought I was a pretty hot coach. I thought I had a pretty hot team. And uh, the score at the end of that game was 5-1 to one, uh, for San Diego. And I tucked my tail between my legs and humbly walked off the field and realized I'd been taught a great lesson. And I always had a lot of respect for him. And so years later, when I was deciding, do I stay at UCLA or not, or, or, you know, or go into the pros and go with the Galaxy, he told me in his uh, distinctive Northern Irish accent, which I'll not try not to imitate, he said, Ziggy, if one doesn't accept the challenges that life brings with it, life's not worth living. And uh, based upon that advice, I decided to leave UCLA along with the advice of others. Uh, Bora Militinovic, you know, the Colombo of soccer coaches. Um, you know, I learned a lot from him. I know sometimes, you know, Bora wasn't everybody's favorite. You know, I, I'm not going to say he was, but, you know, I, there were things, a lot of things that I learned from him, and I'm really appreciative of that. Uh, to my employers, you know, UCLA, first off, you know, to Bob Fisher, who took a chance and hired, hired a 27-year-old head coach in 1980 and gave me a chance to coach to Pete Dallas and Jim Milhorn, who became good friends, who were my mentors there to the LA Galaxy, to, you know, Philip Anschutz, 
who is not only influential with the Galaxy, but the entire MLS and the league, and Tim Laiwicki, who allowed me to have that opportunity to coach the Galaxy then, to Columbus and Clark Hunt, and, and for this tremendous opportunity here in Seattle that Adrian, Joe Roth, Todd Laiwicki at the time, and, and Drew Carey, the ownership group, gave me here, uh, you know, which I'll be forever thankful for. Uh, my colleagues, you know, Dean Wurzberger, obviously, you know, were guys who were very important to me. Timo Leakowski, who's Finnish and another Hartwick guy. You know, there's always Hartwick guys there, but Timo was great because he was Finnish, so you'd get, you know, phone messages from Timo like, Ziggy, Timo, call me, bye. And that would be it. And that was considered a pleasant message from Timo. <laughs> and the one time we went, uh, we played in Argentina in Mar de Plata, and so we had Timo as the head coach. I was the assistant, and our other assistant was Lincoln Phillips, uh, who was originally from Trinidad. And so we're in Mar de Plata, so uh, we had a strange room situation, so I had a top bunk. And Timo was on the bottom, and, uh, and Lincoln was on the other bottom. So Timo would get up and open up the window, because he wanted a little cool air. And then about 20 minutes later, Lincoln would get up and close the window. And then 20 minutes later, Timo would get up and open the window. And 20 minutes later, Lincoln would close the window. And that went on all night, so I didn't get a lot of sleep that night. Uh, obviously, my past assistant coach is Ralph Perez, who's here tonight. I'm honored that he's here. You know, we worked together a lot of years, and there were a lot of coaching schools together as well. Brian Schmetzer right now, my current number one assistant. There's, uh, there's way too many UCLA assistants and professional assistants that I've had, you know, you know too many to, to name them all. But I'm so appreciative of the support, you know, that they gave me and the support that they uh, have helped me, uh, you know, to be able to coach and do the job that I've had. Uh, you know, Bruce Arena, I, I wasn't sure if I was going to tell this, but I'm going to tell one Bruce Arena story, <laughs> which isn't exactly a story about Bruce Arena. But, you know, Bruce has, uh, over the years, obviously we compete, but he's also become a friend as well over those years. And, uh, you know, when uh, I was playing in the Duke tournament, uh, it was George Tarantini, it was, uh, I guess, a character. Is that the best way to describe George? George Tarantini, uh, John Rennie, myself, and Mike Getman go out to dinner. And uh, I'm in that tournament, and George says, we're going to my favorite Greek restaurant. He goes, do you want to sit outside? So I'm thinking, yeah, outside's a pleasant night. We'll sit outside. Well, they really didn't have outside seating. So George got them to move a table outside, and we're sitting in this foyer, you know, that's in these office buildings. And uh, so, so a couple of glasses of wine, and George, who, you know, indulged in, in a cigarette here and there, you know, uh, he had a few glasses now in him. And so he said, Ziggy, I have to tell you this, and I will do George a little bit. He goes, I know you and Bruce, you are very competitive. And I know every time Bruce's team wins the national championship, you slit your wrist just a little bit. <laughs> he goes, but Ziggy, I tell you, every time a UCLA player plays for the national team, Bruce, he slit his wrist a little bit. <laughs> So I wish I had all the titles Bruce had, because uh, he's got more than me. Uh, I've got a few, and I'm very proud of those, but he's definitely got more than me. Uh, but what it all comes down to at the end of the day, and the biggest group that I have to thank is players. Players, players, and players. Okay, winning games and winning titles sometimes bonds that whole group, but at the end of the day, it's the players that have been able to coach and the friendships that have come out of that. You know, there's many players that are here. One of my Former players, Tibor Pelé, got together like 14 guys from the first team I coached at UCLA in 1980. Some guys that I haven't seen in 35 years, guys that came in from Toronto, Atlanta, all kinds of places, which is a, a tremendous honor. And, uh, you know, that for me is what it's all about. Sammy George, Tay Ayani, you know, all the other guys that are in this room, you know, it's, it's, it's something that at the end of the day is the essence of it for me. I was an accountant before I came a full-time coach at UCLA. I would work eight months in accounting and I'd coach UCLA for four months. And that would be that would, what I did from 1980 through 83. And then finally UCLA offered me a full-time job. And I'm a competitive guy, so I gave myself three years. If I didn't win a title in three years, I was going to go back to accounting. Luckily, we won an NC2A championship in year two, so I didn't have to go back to accounting. That was a big thing. 
But the 80 team has a special memory uh, for me as well because as I started to put together the 80 team and we're about to coach, uh, four of my best players walk into my office and tell me that they're planning to redshirt. And I'm like going, okay, are you serious? You know, yeah, we want a redshirt. So I had to convince these guys that, well, you, you can redshirt up to four games. So we got this first road trip that the old coach had organized, which involved us flying from L.A. to Vancouver. Then we had to drive back to Portland, play our first game in Portland, then play in Seattle against UW, and then go to Vancouver and play Simon Fraser, which was a very good NAIA team at the time. So I said, let's get those, through those three games, and, uh, and then we'll see. So we went 3-0 and in those series of games. They decided they were going to play that year. That year we went 18-1-2. and uh, We lost in sudden death overtime to USF on a, on a fantastic goal that hit side netting on us, and, and they went on to win the national title. But now you fast forward years later, and I'm in Seattle coaching, and uh, the illustrious Charles Fisher, who's here today, uh, comes down with the other guys to visit me and looks at me and says, Coach, you know, you know about us you know, thinking about redshirting that year? And I said, yeah, I remember that. He goes, you know, if we had redshirted, your career could have gone massively the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very thankful to the 1980 team, so my career did not go massively the wrong way. Uh. And in conclusion, obviously, Casey and Travis, you know, for Mooch, again, you know, utmost respect. I'm so proud to be not only inducted, but to be inducted with you guys. You know, I think that's something that is, is very special to me. And I uh, just want to thank all the players I've been able to coach and all the friendships I've been able to make. Thank you very much.